Dean, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our service. Just glad everyone is here. Hope everyone is staying dry this morning uh, with the storm. And um, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, Terry McWhorter is our song guide today. And so we're glad he's helping with that. Um, you should have received the, the songs on uh, your email um, and through the text this morning if you want to look at the words. So, Terry, if you would unmute yourself, you can get going. All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad to be with you again. Uh, let's start off with one that uh, everybody should know. Sing it through twice. Uh, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear, may it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Now, Ryan, we didn't go over all this one. I'm not sure how you want to do it. Go ahead and a couple of songs in, or okay. Uh, next one's going to be uh, "How Majestic Is Your Name." Uh, I think everybody should be familiar with this one. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God. Oh, Lord God Almighty, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. Oh, Lord, we praise your name. Oh, Lord, we magnify your name. Prince of peace, mighty God, O Lord God Almighty. Hey, Ryan. All right, thank you, Terry. Mine and that. All right. Well, um, good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's having a good day today. I'm, I'm noticing a pattern, um, and that pattern is uh, that last time it rained and we had to come inside and do everything on Zoom was the last time uh, David was out of town and I had to preach. So I'm noticing a pattern, and there's a sign that maybe, you know, David, when you watch this later, because I know you do, stop going out of town, man. You're, ru you're ruining everything. Um, so, all right. Um, well, today, I just want to briefly, again, you know, talk about something that I think is really important. Um, God is in control. That's something we say. I think that might be a, a Christian's favorite thing to say. Probably more than anything, it's the thing we say to each other. When good things happen, we tend to say that to each other. We say, God is in control. And when bad things happen, 
we quietly remind ourselves that God is in control because, you know, the bad things can't last forever that way. Um, it's almost become a sort of cliche at this point. We say God is in control. But what does it mean? When we say or hear that God is in control, what do we mean when we say that? Um, I think back in my own life from, from about five years ago now, uh, when my mother was in the hospital, um, she's in the ICU, she was, you know, had a breathing tube and had all the IVs hooked up and had to do, you know, uh, uh, dialysis and all, I mean, a whole bunch of things. And there was someone who came uh, to the hospital to visit. And I was I was down there to see her, and you know, put his arm around me and you know, pulled me aside and just you know, gave, trying to get comforting words. And he was I mean, trying to be very comforting, very nice. And then just you know, says you know, it's all right. God is in control. And that wasn't the comforting thing that he intended it to be. Because I was sitting there and I was thinking, but God did not do this. Like I had that, that burning thing in my head. I, I, did, I, couldn't, I, I was wrestling with it. You know, God is in control, but he did not do this. And it's interesting that the very first thing I thought of, and I think that a lot of us are this way too. And when we hear God is in control, the first thing we think about is the idea that God is kind of like an architect. He's making a blueprint of the universe or our lives. Every, you know, an architect, a blueprint, um, I'm not familiar with this kind of thing. Um, I just know this from people tell me and what I'm assuming is true. Um, they're very well planned out. That a blueprint, everything is measured precisely and drawn out precisely. Everything is done out there. And if anything was off, it wouldn't work. But if you think about it, that's often how we think of it when we say God is in control. A lot of us think about it as God kind of, I mean, literally controlling everything. That God controls every circumstance, every thought, every decision. And it doesn't take long to immediately arrive at the, the massive problem with this. Um, the fact that if God is in control like that, if that's what that means, there isn't a whole lot of choice. There isn't a whole lot of, you know, you and me getting to choose to love God and choose to follow God. I mean, if this is true, if God is in control like that, is like an architect planning out every little thing in the universe, God is the one who is solely responsible for the pandemic, the riots, the bitter partisanship, the pain and the misery we face today. And that doesn't even begin to mention all the horrible things that have happened through history. It also means those who reject Christ literally can't do anything else because it's all according to the plan. So I would say, let's just get rid of that view altogether. When we say God is in control what do we mean because we I don't, I don't think i think if we all think about it most of us would agree we don't mean that we don't mean that god is literally like in control of everything i do he's not in control of every thought i make every decision i make to where i have no choice or you have no choice or anyone has no choice perhaps what we mean and i think this is true a lot of times too we mean that what that god is in control means that no matter what happens no matter the situation no matter what life throws at us God can bring out good from bad situations. For example, if you lose your job, God can bring you a better one, lead you to a better place. That's, now, that's not wrong. And, that, and that, I want to affirm that I do believe this is true. Um, but it's essentially everything will be okay wrapped up in Christian lingo. It also kind of reduces God uh, to a sort of cosmic first responder. When things go bad, 
you call nine, you know, in our things go bad, your house is on fire, you call 911. And so the fire department and the ambulance and the cops can come and they're going to, you know, when someone breaks into your house, you call 911 so the police op can come and help you out, you know, all these things. The, way, the second way we can mean it is that, you know, God brings good out of bad situations. It kind of makes God like that. Bad things happen and God is the first one in. He's the first one who's trying to try to fix the situation. Now, again, I do believe God does bring good, can bring good out of the bad situations. But the reason why this doesn't work for totally summing up the phrase, God is in control, is because God fixing the bad situation works when the bad situations get fixed. But they don't always get fixed. You know, bring up my mother, you know, last year, she went, um, her birthday was two weeks ago. It was five years ago on her birthday. I went down to surprise her for her birthday. And that was the day they took her to the hospital. Um, and then she died in December. She never got to go home again, see home again. Um, was God in control? That's a tough question. And again, to stress the point, I do believe with all of my heart that God does bring good out of the bad in our lives. I mean, just thinking of this personal example of mine, um, I don't, I cannot even begin to fathom how different a person I would be today if my mother had not died. Had I not been forced to grow amidst the fertile soil of the pain and the grief that I went through. And solely because of God's grace and his presence and his love, at this point now, when I think of my mother, I, it's, I'm still sad, yes. But it's a sadness that's mingled in with a lot of joy and a lot of remembering her fondly and well and being glad of the lessons and glad of the friendship and glad of the relationship that's there. So while God does bring good things out of the bad, I think that's too small of a picture of what we mean when we say God is in control. Again, this is something we say a lot, and it's something the Bible affirms. So what does it mean? Because we know that God, by his infinite divine power, can do anything. And he often doesn't, at least from our perspective, do things. And it's because God, throughout Scripture, and the Bible's clear on this, has this weird tendency to work through and with people. He doesn't have to. But he does. You think the story of Exodus and the Israelites enslaved by the Egyptians, and they're his people. He's made this promise to them. And God could have, just like that, they would have been freed. The Egyptians could have been gone or had been moved 100 miles into the desert or anything they wanted, or you know, immediately just let them go. But instead, he chose Moses. A guy who is was immensely, by his own definition and own admission, immensely unqualified to do anything. When God was setting up the nation of Israel in the promised land to be their king, he wanted you know, to be their king. He could have come down in glory and shone forth, and you know, as he did in the time Israel traveling, and wrapped in cloud and light. Um, and been their king, and there would have been no question at all who the king was. But instead, he set up Saul and then David and David's family, both men who were immensely unqualified for the task. And the stories go on and on. He chose Peter and Andrew and James and John and the rest of the apostles people who were, again, immensely unqualified. And, you know, the, the Apostle Paul, 
who was an enemy. And by his own admission, read the book of 2 Corinthians, and you see how Paul sees himself as weak, un, only qualified to do this task because God has chosen him. So we know God can do anything, but we also see that he often chooses to work with people. So what does it mean when we say that God is in control? God is in control means that there is nothing that can stop him from keeping his promises. God is in control means that no matter how hard the enemy fights, no matter how hard the world resists, no matter how much we don't deserve it, God will be faithful to what he has promised. No matter what, God will keep his promises. The world cannot stop it. Nothing will stop God's intention and God's plan. Because God has promised multiple things, things that cannot be taken away. God has promised that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor the things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from his love. That's a promise. And when we say God is in control, we are affirming that the promise will be kept and is being kept. God has promised his saints, those who are in Christ Jesus, that he will one day wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more, and neither shall be the mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things will have passed away. And there is nothing that can stop God from keeping that promise. God has promised that he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And there is nothing that can keep him from keeping that promise. God has promised that one day every knee will bow on heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And there is nothing that can keep him from keeping his promise. And God has promised that one day all things will be subjected to Christ so that God may be all in all. Nothing can stop that promise. So church, when we say God is in control, that phrase, God is in control, God is in control is a promise. It's a promise that we experience both now and will one day see fully realized. It's the promise that God is faithful and God will keep his promises. And we, the church, we have a great part to play in all this because I said God likes to team up with people. Well, he's teamed up with those who are in Christ, those who are his church. We are the living symbol of that promise. Church, we are supposed to be the God is in control people. Because we look ahead to one day when Christ returns that God will be in control. There will be no more evil. There will be no more sin. There will be no more rebellion. Everything will be made as it should be. People will be with their God and God will be with them. And everything will be perfect. We are the people who live that promise of the future in the messed up now. We are, should be the people fully surrendered to God's control. And when the world cries out for a sign that God is in control and they're asking questions, where is God on the move? Where is God in our life? Where, where is he? We should be able to stand up and point at God's people and say, there is your sign. Look at what he's done in them, what he's doing in us. 
Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. All things were created by him and through him and for him. And whatever may happen, be it a pandemic or a presidential election, or even the sinful actions of me or you, nothing can stop the promise of renewal and reconciling the world with God. God will one day be all in all. And it has started right here with us, the people who have given their lives to Jesus Christ. So when we say God is in control, we are saying that our hope is bigger than our circumstances. We're saying that our hope, that our confidence that God will fulfill his promises is bigger than the hardships we fall into. It's bigger than the triumphs and the joys we experience. It's bigger and more potent and more powerful and runs deeper in our lives than our jobs, than our hobbies, than our pain and our grief and our happiness, even more than those we love, it's bigger. Because we may lose those we love, but we will never lose the hope we have in God. And that whatever this world throws at us, and we must never forget that the world is broken and sinful and in full rebellion against God and is a mess. And I think it's 2020, you just have to look out the window and you can see my goodness, it's a mess. But whatever it throws at us, we can stand firm on the hope of Jesus Christ. We may fall ill, lose our jobs, go into poverty, get married, have children, get promoted, have wonderful things. Watch loved one die. The Astros might win the World Series again, fairly this time. It probably won't happen, but you know, it's worth dreaming about. And in all this, we may even be maimed, imprisoned, or killed. Still, God's promises will prevail because God is in control. And so today, you have your uh, stuff for communion uh, ready. We take now a symbol of God's control, of God's presence in our lives, that I will be with you always. And we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The death that is the fulfillment of the promise that your sins will be washed away. They will be taken care of. And the resurrection, the promise of new life, and that promise to us that one day we will rise as he has risen. And we proclaim it until he comes, and the promises are fulfilled. It started now in our lives today, but more is coming. This is like the teaser. You know what our lives are? Our lives are like a teaser trailer for a movie or the sneak peek, the preview. When people look at the church, they shouldn't say, that's what heaven will be like. It's little clips, little bit of snippets. They're not always in order. And sometimes we kind of mess it up a little bit. But the real thing's coming. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you so much for the gift of your son. And we thank you so much for your promises, Father. And the fact that you will be faithful and you will keep the promises you have made. Father, as we take this bread now, in remembrance of your son and his death on the cross. Father, help us realize you have always kept your promises and you always will keep your promises. 
It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's pray again. Excuse me. Father, we come before you again just thankful for the blood that was shed on our behalf, the blood that makes us your children, that washes away our sins and brings us into your presence. Father, thank you for Jesus. And Father, we look forward to the day when Jesus returns and we will see you face to face. And it is in his most holy name we pray. Amen. Now, normally this would be the part of the program where we say there is a basket in the back you can put your money into, but obviously not. Again, just to re reiterate, as, as Dean said a couple of weeks ago about the budget, but we do have online giving. You can set up your bank account. You can mail in a check. Um, if, you're, if you're able, if you're struggling financially because this has hit people hard, we understand. Don't worry about it. Um, it's cool. Let us fire David. Keep me on. It's no big deal. Um, clearly, you know, we wouldn't want to get rid of this. So... Just thank you for coming. Um, Terry, do we have a final do you have a final song? All right, you go for it. Unmute yourself and rock and roll. Uh, so I know that my redeemer lives. I know that my redeemer lives and never prays for me. I know eternal life he gives from sin and sorrow free i know i know that my redeemer lives i know i know eternal life he gives i know i know that my redeemer lives he wills that i should holy be in word and thought indeed then i his holy face may see when from this earth my freed i know i know that my redeemer lives i know i know eternal life he gives i know I know that my Redeemer lives. Can we go ahead and have a final prayer?